Last November, Apple sent out a press release. It was all about a brand new service called Right to Repair. But four months on, I'm asking, were we wrong about Right to Repair? Hi, welcome back to me, David. And as I say, we're talking about Right to Repair on this video. Now, if you think back to last November, it kind of caught us all by surprise. The idea was that for the first time ever, Apple were going to encourage you to repair your own products. In the press release, they talked about just two products initially being supported, and that was iPhone 12 and iPhone 13. And they were going to support the most common faults found in phones, that being the screen, battery, and also cameras. And as I say, what you would do is go online, you would get a manual down first to see if you felt confident that you could do repairs, and after that, you would go to the online store and order the parts. In the press release, Apple's CEO, Jeff Williams, mentioned that uh, Apple had gone to a massive expansion program of almost doubling to 5,000 the amount of official repair centers around the world. They didn't want to slow down on that at all, but equally they wanted to encourage people to do these repairs at home. Certainly through the pandemic, it made sense. And that for the first time, as I say, with the support of Apple, you'd be able to do basic repairs yourself. And although this was only going to be run out in the States initially, the idea was that it would uh, run out around the world and also that it wouldn't just stop at iPhone, that it would also be running on to Macs, of which we'll be coming to in just a little bit. We heard there were going to be up to 200 parts and tools made available. And if you carried out your repair successfully, the idea was you would ship your old parts back to Apple. They would recycle them in keeping with their environmental statement and you would get a credit on your Apple account. So it sounded like a really good idea. As I say, the press release itself, I think, did the job. Apple were met with resounding good headlines, and it was a good news story. But as you begin to dig into the story, there's kind of, well, it's always the devil is in the detail, right? So picture this, and let's move away from iPhone for now and look at a Mac. In theory, they're saying you could go out and buy yourself a five, six thousand pound MacBook Pro come back and do some basic repairs on it. Well, good luck to you if you decide to go that route. But equally, equally, I think it's almost a situation where they were win-win. No matter which way this went, Apple, <laughs> as they often do, would end up winning. So in the first instance, you buy the parts from them online. You get them home. You try to do the repair. You make a mess of it. What are you going to do then? You're going to go to an Apple shop and get the repair done by one of the official repair centers. So <laughs> you're going to effectively pay for the parts twice because the parts you put in, you probably won't be able to use again. They'll say they're not valid or that you've damaged them. Almost certainly they'll charge you again for the parts. Obviously, you're paying them for labor as well. So Apple kind of win no matter what you do. So although the press release sounded really good, the devil, as I mentioned, is in the detail. Now, it's all good starting off with iPhone 12 and 13. and I'm a reasonably savvy person, a reasonably practical person. I don't think, though, that I'd begin taking apart an iPhone 12 or 13 and trying to put a new screen on. I'd much rather go to a store where I know it can be done first time, quickly and properly, and everything would be working. The touchscreen would be working, everything that goes with it. I'm sure the manuals that Apple had available are stellar, but nonetheless, I don't trust myself. I don't know about you. Have you tried any of these repairs? Let me know in the comments, have you used the right repair on an iPhone 12 or 13. I'd really love to hear about it because it seems to have gone awfully, awfully quiet. And now onto the main point of this video, and it's all to do with Mac Studio. There's a wonderful creator, I'm sure you watch him, and this video I'm about to talk about has had just under a quarter of a million hits, so I'm pretty sure you will have seen it. Luke Miani has put up a video where he had a pair of Mac Studio, and is that the correct plural? I'm sure it's Mac Studio, if not Mac Studios. But he had a pair of them, in his studio, and he was taking them apart and trying to see if you could swap out the SSDs on the new Mac Studios. Now, for a little bit of background, we know that there's a spare slot in Mac Studio, and what we think it's for is for the extra SSD on the larger versions of storage that you can buy. So whether you end up buying the studio with the uh, Max chip in it or with the Ultra chip in it, you can buy it in one terabyte, two terabyte, four or eight terabyte configurations. And for the two bigger configurations, the four and eight terabyte, we're assuming that is what that second slot is there for. So what Luke decided to do was take apart these two brand new Mac Studios and have a play around and see if we could effectively begin using our own SSD or upgrading and putting more SSD into a Mac Studio that we just paid maybe five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars or pounds for. So the first thing that we saw Luke try was to take an SSD out of one of the Mac Studios and put it into the spare slot on the other Mac Studio. Effectively, of course, that would be doubling up the amount of storage. 
right to repair. That's it all over, isn't it? Isn't that exactly what they were trying to go for when they made that announcement in the press release last year? Well, it turned out that didn't work. And not only didn't it work, they had the temerity to give a warning flashing light on the front that was set to Morse code, and it was the SOS. It has been programmed to dislike the idea of extra storage being put into that slot so much that it goes into a meltdown and puts out an SOS, which, as you know, is a panic call. So, no, the first attempt, the Mac Studio wasn't having any of it. It's 1-0 to the Mac Studio. So what Luke thought he'd try on the second attempt was keeping it more native. He'd take the SSD from the original slot in one Mac Studio and staying in that very same computer putting it into the spare slot. Okay, this time we didn't get the SOS call, but it still wouldn't work. Nothing he tried would make that computer boot. And that is the same physical computer, the same Mac Studio with the same chip. All he's done is move it from one side to the other side. Right to repair. And there was just one more attempt that he made on the video, the third and final attempt, and that was taking the SSD from one of the Mac Studio and putting it into the other, into the slot that was already had an SSD in. So we knew that the slot was registered. We knew that the slot was working. We knew that the firmware and software could see that slot. It was simply swapping out one SSD or another. And don't forget, these are OEMs. These are original Apple parts, barely a week old, let's face it, literally taking one from the other and still no. Putting another SSD into that slot wouldn't work. And we're meant to believe in right to repair, really. So I already had in mind to make this video looking at right repair four months down the line. And then I saw the video from Luke and I just thought it needed tying together. Somehow something isn't adding up. They made this press release. They got great headlines for it. Yes, we were all a little bit surprised. We could see the potential flaws in it. But nonetheless, as I said earlier on, it was a good news story. Apple was suddenly giving us the, the way to repair our own products with original parts. But with the experiment that Luke carried out, it seems we really are no further down the line. Have they just been playing a game with us? Was it literally a way of them ticking a box to make sure that if any officials looked at them, they said, yep, look, we've offered right to repair. It's there in writing. But when you scratch away literally the first veneer of the surface, it cannot be done. Now, these are the two very latest Macs that have been released. So any of the Macs in the lineup were going to be absolutely guaranteed to work with right to repair moving into the era when they said that Apple Silicon Macs would be part of the program. Surely, surely these would be the machines that would be first and foremost, the ones you'd go to first of all, and yet they don't work. Why? It's meant to be in some way modular. At the moment with modular, all you can do is change out the display. Surely if they gave us the ability to upgrade the storage, which is one of the most basic things you'd want to do, isn't this exactly what we're crying out to do? Now, I know people in PC world have been able to swap out SSDs easily, easily. It's something they always take the mick out of us Apple fans and say, oh, you can't even change the SSD. And to be frank, Apple have kind of shot themselves in the foot here. They could have shown us how simple it was to change the SSD. But not only that, the amount of work it took to get inside of these machines to even attempt to change it was shocking. Now, I know Apple have made it very clear over the last few years that that's the way they're going with the system on chip. But this isn't the system on chip. This is interchangeable. You can physically take it out. It is a part. It's a removable volume. There's a spare slot sitting there. They didn't even put in the correct amount of decoders to be able to use that slot. And it just seems a criminal that they would be selling a machine that they know you can't, as an end user, you cannot physically put another chip into. I'm not talking about, I can understand it. If it was going and buying a cheaper SSD, fine, they want you to buy one of their SSDs. I get that. Give us that option. Surely the slot's there. If you decide six months, a year, two years down the line, that you want to increase your storage. These machines aren't cheap. You could keep them for five or 10 years. At some point, it might be great to be able to upgrade the storage yourself. But no, Apple are not giving us that option. So towards the end of the video, Luke suggested that he thought this whole situation could pretty easily be fixed by either a firmware or software update. Now, the only way that that update is going to come is if there are enough loud voices. It's up to you and I to make Apple listen to what we want. And to be fair to them, they have been listening recently. Look at last year's MacBook Pros. Suddenly, we got back all of the ports and IOs that we moaning for years have been taken away in the previous versions of the MacBook Pros. Suddenly, we had an SD card slot back. We had an HDMI port. We had plenty of IO. Everything that we'd wanted was there. So they are listening. It's up to us to make Apple listen. What do you think, though? Do you think this is a crime that they're too arrogant 
to even understand our wishes, our desires to be able to touch anything about a machine that we buy. We get that we're buying into Apple. We know that. But surely something as basic and as rudimentary as being able in time to increase the storage, certainly when the capability is there within the machine, not to be able to do that just seems wrong. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Though. Do get involved. Let me know in the comments. Do you think this is wrong? Would you like to see Apple change it? And are you going to put out a big, loud no so Apple can hear it? And maybe, just maybe, get that software and firmware update that we need. They are listening. It's up to you and I to make them listen. Anyway, that was all I wanted to talk about in this video, the right to repair. Were we wrong about it? Time will tell, but it's up to you and I to make a difference. So let me know in the comments below and I will catch you on the next video.